John chapter 16, uh, Jesus is, is in the upper room. It's uh, called the Upper Room Discourse. It's a, a lengthy conversation over a number of chapters in which Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And at John 16, verse 16, he, he kind of transitions and he starts to talk about uh, his, his coming re- death and, and resurrection, specifically his death and resurrection, and also how that is going to change and impact the life of the disciples. In particular, I'm going to look tonight at one verse, and that is verse 33, which is the last verse of this passage. But I want to begin at at verse 16. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, "What, What does he mean when he says, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I am going to the Father... They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things, and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe, Jesus replied, A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And then this is the verse I'd like to reflect on tonight. Jesus, reflecting on his death and resurrection, he says this, he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is the word of the Lord. Well, like probably most of you, I woke up this past Monday morning to the news of the tragedy that had occurred in Las Vegas the night before. I woke up to read the headlines and to watch some of the videos about this this shooting, this, this massacre that had taken place. And, and I know that it's been already, it's been in a week since it's happened, but I find it tough uh, not to be thinking about it. it. It's something that I still struggle to wrap my mind around. It, it, it feels like every time you think you've seen it all, then something like this comes along. You know, you, you, you read the news about this tragedy, you watch the videos, and, and I think you can't help but be left shaking your head. You can't help but watch this and look at it and say, what is wrong with the world? It's hard not to look at this and say, well, what's wrong with with people, right? How does this happen? How do we end up doing this to each other? You can't help but see this and say, you know, there's just something about it that's just not right. The tragedy that occurred in Vegas last Sunday night It provides a picture, albeit an extreme picture, 
of the brokenness of this life. And yet one of the things that it does is it it brings up in people, it stirs in people these emotions, these desires for something better. Whether you're religious or not, people look at, at, at that video and they look at the news about this event And they desire a better place. They desire something more. They desire a a world unlike what this is. People want a world of peace. They want a world without tragedy. They want a world without this violence, without this anger, this hatred, this murder. Well, Jesus teaches us tonight that as Christians, that, that desire... That desire has to shape our prayers. You see, the troubles of this life, from a Christian perspective, they are not meant to to hinder or to stop our prayers, but it it is actually the brokenness, the trouble of this life, that should be the thing that drives and that motivates and that that shapes our prayers. Seeing the brokenness of this life is, is one of the things that should cause us to pray your kingdom come. And that's the petition, that's the request I want to reflect on tonight. Your kingdom come. Now the the phrase itself, the words in and of themselves, they they suggest that this kingdom that is coming is is better than the kingdom that we have now here. And, And if this is something that Jesus implies in the Lord's Prayer, certainly it's something that he teaches explicitly in his ministry. Jesus, throughout his ministry, he's calling people to believe and to to, to come to the kingdom of God. You think of uh, just one of the Gospels, you think of like Luke 5. Jesus comes and he calls people to repent and to believe in the kingdom of God. Luke 9, Jesus sends his disciples out and he calls them to go and to proclaim the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is just It's so essential to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Herman Ritterboss, who's a a well-known theologian, Herman Ritterboss says, the whole of the preaching of Jesus Christ and his apostles is concerned with the kingdom of God. And one of the things that you notice is that Christ is is constantly holding up the kingdom of God as, as something that is superior to our kingdom here on earth. One of the things that he does throughout his ministry and his teaching is that he holds these two things kind of in, in, in contrast with each other. One, right, one is defined by things like death and pain and, and anger and hurt and rage and violence and jealousy. The other is defined in terms of life and grace and joy and love and peace. And so I think a good question for us to ask tonight as we kind of reflect on this is is the question, what kingdom are we living for? All right, maybe more closely tied to our topic tonight, maybe we should just ask the question, what kingdom are we praying for? Right, are are we focusing on our kingdom here on earth or are we focusing on on God's kingdom, on, on, on the kingdom of God? Are we focusing mostly on our world or on God's world? And I want to spend just a few minutes tonight kind of comparing those two and reflecting on the different character of those two kingdoms. So looking first then at, the, at our kingdom, you could say our world, the kingdom here on earth, Jesus says something interesting about this kingdom in John 16, verse 33. Right in the middle of the verse, he says this, In this world, there will be be trouble. Jesus offers just one categorical statement. No qualifications, no conditions, just fact, just reality. And it is reality, is it not? I mean, anybody, whether you're, you're younger here or older here tonight, anybody that has spent any amount of time experiencing life on this place we call earth has seen, has, has heard, has felt, has been touched to some degree by the brokenness of life. Everybody has felt it 
in one way or the other. No, it's not, it, it's not always extreme, okay? It's not always extreme like Las Vegas. But it happens in many other ways. It happens in these tragic car accidents. It happens with cancer. It happens with things like anxiety. It happens with depression. It happens with chronic pain. And if we, we look at other things, it happens with people losing their job. It, it, it happens with strained relationships. It happens with financial stress. And if you even scale back further, if you look at just the big picture, it happens globally. There's, there's war, there's terrorism, there's natural disasters. In this world, Christ is absolutely right. There is trouble constantly. And history has, has proven this time and, and time again. I came across a, uh, a study this past week. It was a, a group of academics that had looked at, I think, civilization, basically 3,600 before Christ and, and on. And they, they, they looked at this, and they'd analyzed all sorts of things, and they'd come to the conclusion that in all of this time, some 6,000 years, the world has experienced only about 290 years of peace. And that's probably a, a generous guess. In this world, there will be trouble. And I think that the, the, the challenging thing about life here on this earth in this kingdom is that you can't just take the trouble and the people and just kind of isolate them. Right? You can't deal with trouble by just saying, hey, we're going to take all of the troublemakers and separate them from the rest of society and we'll be fine. Because trouble is deeper than that. Right? It, it, it's, it's something that lies within the human heart. For me, a passage that has always, always resonated is this passage, Jeremiah 17, verse 9, where Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. And so the reason we, we, we struggle so much in this world is because we live in a world that is deceived, a world that has bought a great lie. And that lie is that you don't need God. That is a lie that has, has led to the downfall of humanity, and it is a lie that continues to lead to the downfall of humanity. That is, that is the opening pages of Scripture. Right? If, you, if you have time later, you can look in your, in your Bibles at Genesis 1 through, through 4 as the story unfolds. You have God that makes a world that is good. It's described as very good. You, you have Adam, you have Eve, you have a garden, you have, you have God with them, God walking among them. There's harmony. Harmony. And that world is very good, not just because there's an absence of trouble. That world is good because there's peace with God. There's communion with God. And, and what I love about those opening chapters is it gives you a bit of a, a, of a picture of what life in God's kingdom looks like. But of course, you know that, that shortly thereafter, in comes Satan, who is appropriately described as, as the great deceiver, and he tells one great lie. One lie, and that lie is that you don't need God. In fact, he pushes it a bit further, and he says, you, you don't even need God's kingdom. And, and that is the same kind of deceit that we deal with today. The idea that this can be your kingdom. And that you, Adam, Eve, whoever you are here tonight, you can be king. Opening chapters, this contrast between God's kingdom and between our kingdom here on earth. Something that always strikes me is that Genesis 4 really starts the, the story of, of man's kingdom and immediately you have trouble. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed that? It's not like there's a gradual decline into issues among humanity. It's not like there's a slow transition where we spiral out of control you buy the lie, you don't need God. Next verses, Cain, Abel, anger, jealousy, violence, hatred, murder. And these are the types of things that happen 
in a world where you don't think you need God. And the truth is that as long as we live in a world where, where people don't think they need God, there, as Christ says, there will be trouble. You will have things like war, you will, you'll have things like violence, you'll have terrorism, you will have even tragedies like what occurred in Vegas. There's trouble. Now, the political left, the political left will say that you need gun control. That's how you solve the trouble. The political right, on the other hand, is going to say what you need is much tighter security. Right? I love just reading the headlines. One side's blaming the NRA, the other side's blaming the CIA. People are just... But the point is that you can legislate against guns and not eliminate trouble. The point is that you can, you can confiscate against tr- guns and, and, and you won't eliminate trouble. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we shouldn't ask some practical questions when you have a tragedy like this occur. I mean, you can call this my naive Canadian perspective, but I don't see the wisdom in your average citizen having an assault rifle. I don't see it. I don't see the wisdom in being able to purchase attachments that can turn these things into automatic weapons that you can just play with for fun. I don't see the wisdom in that. But dealing with those things doesn't deal with trouble. The the issue that we have is we live in a world that desires to eliminate trouble, but does not desire to pursue peace with God. Because that's life on our kingdom on this earth where we try to solve our solutions without God, where we live without a need for God. And as long as that is the character of this place, then our society will have trouble, our communities will have trouble, our families will have trouble, our life as individuals will experience trouble. You can't have true peace without peace with God. And so perhaps then that's, that's also a time for us then to reflect ourselves on, on the question, how do we deal with trouble? Right? How do we deal with it in our lives? How do we deal with it in, in our families, in our workplace? Right? Are, we, are we trying to solve trouble with our own ingenuity and our own solutions? Or are we, are we actually thinking about pursuing peace with God and, and, and needing God and, and trusting God? God. It is so easy for us to kind of slip into this mode where we're actually really worried about ourselves. And one of the great things about prayer is that prayer can help you identify that. It can help you realize when when you're going this direction, you can actually look at your prayer and start asking the question, am I actually really praying about my kingdom or am I, is my prayer actually about God's kingdom? Right? Sometimes you, you look at it and you say, am I really just praying that God would eliminate trouble from my life or am I actually praying that I would experience peace with God? There's really only two choices here. There is, there is the trouble that we experience in this life or there is, there is a peace with God that is experienced with his kingdom. And I want to I look just in closing at, at God's kingdom, right? If our kingdom is characterized by trouble, then God's kingdom is one of, of peace. And what I love about, about what Jesus says in John 16, verse 33, is that he makes clear the fact that you can't escape this life. You can't avoid trouble, but he does say you can find peace with God. Right, Jesus, he's pointing to his death and his resurrection in John 16. And then he says, I tell you these things so that in me you may have peace. That verse, Jesus says, I understand the fact that this world, there will be trouble. But he also says, take heart because I have overcome the world. Again, Jesus is contrasting these two kingdoms very, very different. And the gospel message that comes each and every week is that if you are in a world of trouble, don't look to yourself. 
Right? Don't look to your own ingenuity or your own reliability. You can't buy your way out of the problem. You can't purchase your way out of the problem. You can't study your way out of the problem. Christ is very simple here. He says, you got to look to the cross. you got to look to me, and you will experience the peace of God. And so when we pray, when we say these words, your kingdom come, we are not just praying for a for a future reality. Yes, we pray for the fullness of, of the kingdom of God, for it to be realized. But we're also praying that, that we and others might experience a peace with God today. And the peace that Jesus Christ offers is not the absence of trouble. The peace that Christ offers to you is not that trouble will be removed from your life, but he does say that God will be with you throughout the trouble. And that Christian perspective, it just changes the way that you deal with trouble in your life. I read a story a little while ago about a man named Nicholas Ridley. Nicholas Ridley was a uh, a theologian. He was also a pastor. He lived in England somewhere around 1550, 1555, and he was martyred under under the reign of of, uh, Queen Mary. Mary of England, sometimes known as Bloody Mary. He was burned at the stake, but as the story goes, the night before he was to be executed, his brother came to visit him in prison. His brother was concerned about him, and he thought, well, I'll come and I will offer some comfort, I will offer some assistance. But Ridley declined the offer. Ridley actually said to his brother, you can, you can go home because I plan to go to bed early and I, I plan to sleep as quietly as I have ever slept in my life. And I read that story and I thought, how do you explain that? I think the only way you can explain that is to say that Ridley knew something of what Paul was talking about in Philippians 4 when he said there is the peace with God that surpasses understanding. Maybe you're here tonight and you're asking, well, how do I have that peace with God? How do I have that in my life? Well, I think it's not just by seeking God. It's not just by prayer. But it's also by actually submitting to God. Now, I don't know exactly always how to phrase that perfectly for you, but but it's not just about prayer. I mean, if you witness the events of Vegas last week, a lot of people pray. A lot of people pray. The president offers prayers. The The governor offers prayers. The mayor offers prayer. The hashtag pray for Vegas takes over the internet. But when you're praying the words, your kingdom come, you're you're praying something deeper. You're praying, God, help me to submit to the king. You're, You're praying and you're saying, God, help me not just to look to the cross, not just to look to Christ, but you're praying, help me to take up my cross. Help me to follow Christ. Everything hinges around the cross of Christ. How do you eliminate selfishness? Well, you do it by sacrifice. How do you eliminate hate? Well, you overcome it with love. How do you overcome evil? You do it with good. How do you deal with violence and anger? You do it by bringing peace. And all of that happens at the cross of Christ. And if you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you, if you look to the cross, if you find what you need there, then something remarkable happens in your life. And that is that that deceitful heart is removed and God gives you a heart of flesh, a heart that loves Christ, a heart that lives passionately for Christ, a heart that follows Christ, a heart that starts to overcome evil with good, a heart that sets aside violence and anger and is willing to pursue peace. And so when we pray those words, may your kingdom come, we're praying, God, could we have that heart? Could you show your kingdom to me? Maybe for the first time, can you show that kingdom to me more and more? And God, can you please reveal that kingdom to others. Let's pray together.
Our Father, we, we thank you for the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we recognize that the cross, it is not just the way to the kingdom, but it is the kingdom come. Father, we recognize that, that the cross is, is crucial to everything that we hold dear. And Lord, would you help us to experience the power of the cross, not just one day in the future, but also already here today. God, would you help us to submit to the kingship of Jesus Christ, Help us not just to be people who pray to you, but people who also submit to your will. Who live the life that you have called us to live. Who do it with, with great thanks, with great joy. Lord, you know that we can't remove trouble from our lives. You know that it's a reality for us. It's a struggle for us. And yet help us to recognize that there is peace. And Lord God, we pray that you would help us to experience that peace in a very, very powerful way. Resting in you, resting in the arms of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, hold us, strengthen us, lead us, give us eyes to see, hearts that believe. Help us to recognize that the forgiveness that we need is found right there at the cross of Christ. Hear us, Lord. Hear us in his name, in the name of our Savior, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.